On E by Lee Sloan. Narrated by Matthew Haynes. Ed Fierce, only hours ago, buried his daughter. No, not at a funeral. Ed, the loving father he was, strangled her with jumper cables. The two of them, Ed and Lovey, his wife picked her name, had been leaving C.B. Bluff Penitentiary, where Ed's kid brother was incarcerated for murdering six people. Every year, Ed would go and see Herb for a few hours. The two of them would play a few games of cards and have general conversation. Sometimes it would get heated, especially any time Mom and Dad were brought up. Ed hated leaving his brother behind at that dirty prison. A brother's love was a strong bond. Ed never felt his brother did anything wrong. Herb was a sick man indeed, and perhaps under the rationale of some geometric conditional statement, Ed was crazy too. Anyhow, this visit had been a little different. Ed brought his preteen daughter, 11-year-old Lovey, with him. Gloria, Ed's wife, suggested that the two of them finally meet in person. Ed was against it the entire conversation. But with Gloria, and then Lovey pressing him, he eventually caved. Lovey had only read letters from Herb and seen old photos of him. He had been in jail long before she was even thought of. The visit started out fine. Ed and Lovey went through all the processes required for entering the prison, and finally, Herb was brought out in shackles. The glossy white scars on his hands were obvious from yards away. The scars were the results of a handful of victims fighting back. One of the unfortunate souls, Brenda Beechwood, managed to get a hold of Herb's knife and nearly severed a finger. Herb won in the end and severed her head. Ed nodded at his baby brother when their eyes met. While Herb was approaching the metal table and chair bolted to the floor before it, Ed forgot all about his daughter beside him. Herb dropped down into the chair. The chains around his ankles and wrists clanged about, echoing off the cinder block walls. Herb smiled. Ed watched his eyes lock on to Lovey. You must be my niece. The prisoner spoke. His voice was heavy and scratchy, as if a wool sweater lined his throat. Lovey nodded at the tattooed stranger. Ed's arm dropped around her shoulder, pulled her close. Herb, this is Lovey. Lovey, this is my brother, Herb. Herb raised both arms. The metal chain scraped against the edge of the table as they rose from Herb's lap, then coiled up on the table's surface like bulky metal snakes. A scarred fist unfurled into a calloused hand, concrete fingers extending toward Lovey. Pleased to meet you, Lovey. Ed nudged Lovey's shoulder because at first she didn't move. He won't bite, Lovey. Ed and Herb both bore the same family smile when Lovey's hand settled into Herb's. The six foot six giant's paw was gentle with Lovey's tiny hand, which briefly disappeared into her uncle's. After what seemed like an eternity to Ed, Herb released Lovey. Herb strained his neck all the way to the left, cracking it. He closed his eyes and did it again, this time on the right side. You resemble your mom. Look just like her. Herb spoke, leaning back in the chair. Ed watched Lovey offer an awkward smile from the corner of his eye. Ed interrupted the tiny thank you Lovey replied with, they treating you right in here, Herb? Ed lit a cigarette and offered one to Herb. The giant leaned in and accepted the cigarette. It looked like a toothpick between his parched lips. Herb's size would intimidate even the biggest of bodybuilders. His stature and strength meant none of the inmates picked on him. They only moved out of the way whenever he was coming. One inmate tried messing with Herb, a real crazy that the others called Quack. This particular inmate was known as Quack because of his incessant yelling, which resembled a noisy duck. One day, Quack took a bread roll off Herb's tray. The guards didn't make it to the scene in time. Herb had picked Quack up by the neck, took his ankles with the other hand, and bent him backwards over his knee. 
Quack's spine broke like a broom handle. It took three guards to get his body away from Herb, who had turned Quack into a stapler. <sighs> as good as it gets, I suppose, Herb conceded, taking a fat drag from the cigarette. Ed opened his mouth to speak, but Lovey interrupted this time. She spoke directly to Herb. Did you kill people? The room fell silent, except for the heavy breathing of a rotund guard positioned a few feet behind Herb. Herb took another long pull from the cigarette, ashes falling onto the metal table in front of him. He leaned toward Lovey, his substantial frame blocking the single bulb hanging from the ceiling above and casting a shadow over her, swallowing her. Lots. Lovey didn't recoil. Why? Same reason the smoke. I liked it. Would you kill me? Herb blew a white blast of smoke from the corner of his mouth. Ed knew that he must like Lovey. Otherwise, he would have let the smoke blow right into her face. Nah, family's off limits. Besides, you're too cute to kill. Herb used a thumb and finger to squeeze Lovey's chin. She smiled up at her uncle. Ed reached for another cigarette. He fumbled the pack, and the rest of the cigarette spilled out onto the ground. Never were too good with your hands, little brother. Herb snorted, spitting out the cigarette butt. Ed stood from the table and grabbed Lovey's arm. Lovey, say goodbye to your uncle. We have to go. Already? I haven't even got to talk to him much. Lovey protested. Herb smiled at this. Sounds like the little lady wants to stay. That's too bad. See you later, Herb. Ed objected. He pulled a reluctant Lovey toward the exit. Herb waved a slow hand goodbye as the guards directed him away from the visitation table. Back in the truck... Ed breathed angrily over his steering wheel, guiding their ride home back onto the country highway. The two rode in silence for a while. Daddy, why did you want to leave so bad? Did I do something wrong? Ed smashed his foot down onto the gas pedal. The truck lurched forward like an old man with a bad cough. You're gonna be just like him! Ed scolded her. Lovey looked taken aback. But wait! What? What did I do? Ed squeezed the steering wheel so hard his knuckles ached. He tells you he's killed people, and you just sit there smiling at him. What in the fuck is wrong with you, girl? Daddy, you're the one that says Uncle Herb never did nothing wrong. So why are you mad at me for smiling at him? Ed depressed the brake pedal with all his might. The truck nosed forward and skidded to a stop on the orange highway. Ed turned to face his daughter. A finger made its way almost up her nose. The way I speak of my brother is none of your goddamn concern. You understand? I knew bringing you here was a dumb idea, but your bitch mom opened her fucking mouth and pushed me. I'm tired of everyone fucking pushing me. Lovey started to cry, but her tears stifled when the engine of the truck died. God damn it! Ed cried. He turned the ignition switch to the off position then twisted it all the way on. The engine brayed, but didn't turn over. Daddy, what's wrong? Lovey started, but her father's hand whipping across her face deleted the rest of her sentence from existence. Ed tried the engine again. Nothing. He opened the driver's side door of the truck and stepped out. He opened the door to the back seat and retrieved a pair of jumper cables. Lovey whimpered in the front seat cradling her red cheek. Ed opened the driver's side door again and faced Lovey. We need to jump it off. Battery probably died. Stay in the truck. Ed looked around. The highway stretched off infinitely in both directions. Not a living soul to be seen for miles. Ed couldn't jump the battery without another vehicle. He felt his face grow hot with panic. He looked at Lovey through the windshield. Her eyes had hatred buried behind them. He opened the hood, obscuring his view of her. The battery looked fine. No corrosion. 
no smoke coming from under the hood. What the fuck happened? Either way, he needed someone's help. In a blur, a car blew past the pickup truck and roared off into the distance. Ed, desperate to get the car's attention, waved his arms and jumped up and down. The car didn't stop. Ed threw his baseball cap onto the ground and stomped all over it. He went to the passenger side window and banged on it, then motioned for Lovey to roll the window down. She did. Did you see that car coming? He shouted. Yes. Well, why the fuck didn't you get out and flag it down? Lovey stared at her father. You told me to stay in the car. Ed roared and punched the window to the seat behind Lovey. It shattered inside the truck. Ed opened Lovey's door. Get out! He demanded. Are you just gonna hit me again? Get out! Ed felt like his ears were going to blow from both sides of his head. There was a pressure building up in his skull. And it hurt. Love it, I swear to fucking God! You'll what, Dad? Kill me? Like your brother? Ed felt like his eardrum on the left side burst in that moment. He leaned forward and grabbed Lovey's arm and pulled her from the passenger seat. He pushed her against the side of the truck by her slim shoulders. You think that shit's funny, don't you? Ed prodded, flecks of spit hitting Lovey in the face. You think everything's so damn funny? That why you were smiling at my brother back there? Ed roared. Lovey squirmed in her father's grip. I smiled at him because he treated me better than you ever have. Lovey said in a matter-of-fact tone, and spit into her father's face. The other ear drum blew, and Ed threw his daughter down. As if by instinct, he grabbed the jumper cables from the ground and wrapped them around Lovey's neck and pulled. Ed's vision blurred, all senses channeled into pulling those cables tight. It was over as quickly as it started. When his senses returned, his daughter lay in a heap in front of him, the cords still around her neck, her head the color of a ripe plum. The sun had almost finished setting across the horizon, and no other cars had driven by. With reality taking hold of him, Ed realized he didn't want another car to come by. Not until he got rid of Lovey's body. First, he removed the jumper cables from her body and rolled them up neatly and placed them back under the back seat of his truck. Then, he fished out a small shovel from the large bag of tools in the bed of the truck. It was just a little hand shovel, but it was better than nothing. Lovey only weighed about 90 pounds, so carrying her out into the field was a breeze. Once there, the ex-father dug a shallow grave, stripped Lovey of all her clothes, and deposited her into it. Herb's words rang out in his mind and made him flinch. Family is off limits. He figured the area was desolate enough that nobody would ever find her here. And if the wildlife dug her up, certain species of them would eat her for sure. He dug another hole a few yards away and buried her clothes. After the deed was done, Ed went back to his truck. He needed to get home. Needed to come up with a story to feed his wife. None of this was going to be easy. Back to square one. Ed hopped into the driver's seat of the truck and tried turning the engine over. Still nothing. Ed noticed it and threw himself against the seat. What a fool. The gas gauge needle was on E. The battery was fine. The truck was fine. It just needed gas. Ed felt like an idiot. What a real mess this was. With Lovey no longer an issue, Ed grabbed the empty fuel canister from the back seat of the truck and started walking. There was a service station up the road, but it was quite a hike. A coyote howled in the distance. The sun was gone, 
Ed had been walking for at least five miles now and still had long to go. He wouldn't get there until sunrise at this rate. There had to be a better way. He felt relief wash over him when he saw something glowing red in the distance. Two dim red lights. Park lights. Someone was pulled over on the side of the road. Ed picked up the pace. Finally, he was close enough to make out the car. He stopped. It was the same car that had blown by him and Lovey earlier. What was it doing there? Had the car broken down or run out of gas, too? Ed cautiously got closer to the car and could hear noises coming from it. A woman. Moaning? Was someone having sex? No. The noises sounded too painful to be the standard utterances of lovemaking. Ed was close enough now to see a woman's legs hanging out from the open back door of the car. In front of her, a man stood. He was leaning into the car and offering kind words over her cries of pain. You can do it, baby. Our little girl is almost here. You can do this. We've come so far. Everything clicked for Ed now. They sped by earlier because the woman was in labor. He laughed to himself. Seems like they should have left the house sooner. Ed wasn't sure what to do next. He only had the gas can with him. He could siphon their gas. He couldn't. No hose. He could just take the car. How? Could he kill both of them? Then what? The shovel was in his truck five miles back. Was he supposed to kill him? What if she finished having the baby? He couldn't kill a baby. Could he? He just killed his daughter. All of these thoughts raced through Ed's mind while he clutched the gas can close to his body. <coughs> crying. A baby crying. She's here. Our little girl's here. The woman had given birth. The father pulled the baby from inside the car and held it in his arms. The baby was drenched in blood, screaming its head off. Ed saw the new father turn his head and lock eyes with him. Saw his elation turn to terror. Who are you? The man stuttered shielding his newborn daughter from the stranger. The woman yelled with bated breath from inside the car. Who is that? What's going on, Daniel? Daniel responded. Some stranger, honey. I got this. You rest. Ed stared at Daniel and his new daughter. Wait, you're that guy from back there on the road. Broken down pickup. I saw you. You had a little girl with you. Where's she? Ed lowered his head. He ignored the questions. I need your car. Daniel cocked his head. He could hardly hear his reply over the baby's wailing. What? Your car! He insisted. His hand was positioned over his hip, trying to create the illusion that he had a gun. Okay, okay. Just let me get you the keys. Daniel assured. Ed kept his posture and watched Daniel lean into the front seat of the car. He came back out a moment later with a gun and shot Ed in the stomach. Once again, both of Ed's eardrums burst, but this time he buckled under his own weight. The hand that was once positioned over his hip was now trying desperately to cover the open wound in his stomach. Blood seeped through his fingers and stained the orange asphalt crimson. Daniel had phoned the police about the incident, and also requested an ambulance for his wife. Ed did not succumb to his injury, but was instead incarcerated at C.B. Bluff Penitentiary for the murder of Lovey Fierce and attempted car theft of Daniel and Becky Waters. It didn't take the police much time to piece together what had happened based off Daniel's sworn statement. Now it was a month later, and Ed sat in the penitentiary cafeteria, eating semi-stale green beans and two small slices of turkey, when a man sat down next to him. Ed watched his bread roll disappear off his plate and into the man's maw. You already know what's gonna happen next, don't you? 
Herb said, mouth partially full. Crumbs spilled all over the table and onto the floor near Ed's feet. Ed looked up at him. Family's off limits. Herb smirked and swallowed another chunk of bread. You ain't family no more.